right. So, well, anyways, Carolyn, thank you so much for the for the introductions and uh, and Betty uh, Seagull, thank you for the invitation as well. And I appreciate the chance to to talk to you about well, something honestly, I don't have a ton of expertise in. When <laughs> when Carolyn introduced me and kind of read that bio on my you know OU website. You notice there's nothing in there about uh, terrestrial ecosystems or earthworms or anything like that. I'm very much an aquatic, uh, you know, ecologist, but I do have an expert. I do have some expertise in exotic invasive species. And, you know, how did I come to, to, to know a bit about earthworms? Well, when I started my job at Oakland University in 2008, um, it was like, you know, my first day on the job. And I went for a walk on our biological preserve with this young woman who wanted to do a master's thesis with me. Her name was Holly Greiner, well, her name still is Holly Greiner. And we were down there for about five minutes and I had been working a little bit with earthworms in Alaska. And so we're down at the preserve, uh, you know, at Oakland University campus. And we'd been there for just a few minutes. We rolled over a log and it was just seething. It's, you know, this is late summer at this point. So it's, you know, mid August, something like that. I think it was actually August 15th roll over this log and it's just seething with these worms that I had never seen before. And at that point, I had never seen a jumping worm before. I had heard about them, but I had kind of associated with them as being, you know, primarily in like the American South and the Appalachian Mountains. That's where most of the research had been, had been done. And so I was really excited to see them here in Michigan, um, but, you know, uh, a, a bit deflated at the same time, because on the one hand, you're like, oh, no, there's this terrible invasive species. But on the other hand, it is it is interesting because they are very interesting organisms. So anyway, that's a little bit about how I came to work on these. And I did want to mention, too, that I am a bit of a plant person. I have a um, I have two acres of land and about one of those acres is a wet meadow that the previous owners had been mowing kind of down to turf grass for like the past 40 years. And I'm like, well, I really don't want to mow this. I'm going to just kind of let it let it go wild. And it turns out it had a really healthy latent seam bank to it. And I was getting all sorts of beautiful wild plants. And I'm not from Michigan. So this was a chance for me to learn some of my Michigan wildflowers. And I had all sorts of beautiful wetland plants coming up. And that's a big thing I do now with my family. That's kind of my hobby is we're restoring this wet meadow. So any expendable income that we have goes right into plants and seeds and things like that. So anyways, that was kind of a long introduction, but I'll just jump right into it. So today I've got about 25 slides and uh, today I'm gonna talk about exotic invasive earthworms in Michigan. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about their ecological impacts, how to identify them and, uh, and then how to prevent their spread further. So let's see if I can get this going. So, well, I just wanted to start out with a slide. Uh, this, this is the sort of nutrient cycling slide that you can find in any introductory ecology textbook and I just talk about how, you know, nutrients get recycled in our global biosphere. Uh, you know, nutrients don't, uh, you know, like nitrogen don't get manufactured. It's the same nitrogen that's been kicking around for, for millennia. Um, so it gets recycled and it, you know, it starts off as, as dinitrogen gas. Let's see if I can get my laser pointer going here for you. It starts off as dinitrogen gas and then it can get fixed and taken up by biota and converted into nitrate. And then it can get, you know, blown back to the atmosphere as dinitrogen gas again. And it's, you know, it's completed a cycle. That's what we say when we talk about nutrient cycling. It's gone from dinitrogen gas to dinitrogen gas, right? Um, so I just wanted to point out that, you know, according to the sort of classical perspective on nutrient cycling, all of this nutrient cycling done in the world is, is really just done by, by two groups of organisms, plants and microbes, right? According to these sort of box and arrows diagrams, that's it. But I did want to point out, and you know, something that I'm that I'm increasingly being convinced of is that animals have very important role in nutrient cycling in ecosystems as well. And just you know, notice in this picture here, there's no uh, there's no ecosystem engineers, there's no animals consuming this organic matter, which greatly speed up nutrient cycling. So you know, uh, animals have been badly neglected, in my opinion, from these sort of nutrient cycling studies that have been test, uh, tested in the past. And earthworms are very much ecosystem engineers. So what does that mean exactly? Well, an ecosystem en engineer is anything that physically modifies or creates a habitat. And earthworms very much do that. They physically modify their soil habitats. They can influence, flu influence resource availability. They can influence soil chemistry. They influence radox conditions. They can influence the amount of moisture that's available. And this can translate to widespread landscape scale impacts to streams and rivers. And what's really about interesting in earthworms in Michigan, so here we are in Michigan over in the right-hand side. So here's the Laurentian Great Lakes where we live. Well, here's you guys over in Lansing. And here's me not too far away, about an hour and a half uh, 
down in Southeast Michigan at Oakland University. Um, notice that, you know, both of our respective locations at the end of the Pleistocene, 15, 17,000 years ago, uh, both of our respective locales were about you know, a, a kilometer or so underneath the ice, right? So I think you'll agree that being underneath a, you know, a continental ice sheet like this is, it's pretty bad habitat if you're a soft bodied invertebrate like an earthworm. And because earthworms and other small invertebrates are pretty slow moving, uh, they still haven't naturally colonized all of this blue area where the glaciers were about 15,000 years ago. So it's important to keep in mind that our deciduous forest, our mixed deciduous forest, our coniferous forest, all of our ecosystems have evolved and become adapted to a context that doesn't have any native earthworms in it. So uh, this is surprising to a lot of people that all earthworms in Michigan are exotic. And I'm not talking about just jumping worms here. I'm talking about all earthworms that are out, uh, out there. All of them in Michigan are exotic. Well, how did they get here? Well, they've been getting here for a long, long time, right? So here's a little cartoon diagram of the Mayflower. It turns out when, when colonists were coming over from Europe, uh, they would often bring relatively empty ships and they would keep them empty so that they could, I don't know, I guess send cargo back to the new world, but they needed some weight on board. They needed some ballast and they would awfully simply use European soil. They would just have bags and bags of soil from ports and you know, London and, and, and Holland and elsewhere around Europe. And of course, when they would get to the new world, they would just take those those bags of soil, all that ballast, and they would dump it into the new world. And so anything, now this is an important lesson. Gosh, I mean, if I had to leave this gardening club, you know, you know wild ones with one message, it would be that you know, anything that moves soil around the landscape is going to move around soil organisms, including earthworms as well. So, you know, this is how we got them from Europe, uh, you know, over the past few hundred years from ballast soil. And now that they're here, they also get around through some other vectors, uh, lots and lots of plants, ornamental plants are transported from Asia, uh, for example. Uh, there's a huge vermiculture industry around fishing. I mean, I challenge you to find a kind of a rural gas station in Michigan that doesn't have a waltz crawlers sign in front of it. This is a, a big vermicomposting business in Michigan and they sell those, uh, those earthworms as bait. Um, so you can go to any corner store in Michigan and buy a little container of exotic invasive earthworms. Uh, they get spread through the vermiculture and composting industry. You can go on the internet and order composting worms and have them delivered to your door. And a lot of what gets delivered is in fact exotic invasive earthworms. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. And logging is an important source of transport as well. When I was working in Alaska on exotic invasive earthworms, we were working in pretty pristine rainforests in Southeast Michigan. And yet we were finding all of these European earthworm species there. And what was happening was that there was water, uh, there was timber harvest much higher in the watershed and that was introducing these earthworms to that river. They were again subsequently transported downstream where I was working. And so they were being introduced into these you know, pretty, pretty pristine, unimpacted rainforest in Michigan. So these are some ways that earthworms get around the landscape. And uh, I wanna point out too that uh, it's not just the worms that get around, it's also their reproductive structures called uh, cocoons. They're really, really more akin to eggs. These are, are fully developed embryos inside of these little structures. Here's a penny for scale. And as you can see, you know, they're, they're really, really small. So anything that moves any kind of soil can also move these cocoons around in the landscape. And in most instances, these little cocoons, they're a lot more robust than actual earthworms. Earthworms are susceptible to freezing and drying out, desiccation, et cetera. But these little cocoons, they're a lot more durable, a lot more hardy, and they can get around landscapes very, very readily. Okay, well, these exotic European earthworms that I was mentioning, how do they influence forest soils? I would first like to start by saying, you know, most of what we know about the undesirable impacts of exotic invasive earthworms comes from studies of European earthworms. So this is a nice profile of a Michigan soil. This is the upper O horizon. Uh, this is what our soils used to look like historically. I wanna point out that this has a really, really thick duff layer here. So this is on the order of what, six or seven inches. It's very poorly decomposed organic matter. Within this organic matter are lots of interstices, little spaces, little habitats, crevices, et cetera, for organisms. Uh, they're very well aerated, so they're, they're well oxygenated. They have a tremendous water storage capacity. This is called a duff layer. And when you walk across it, if you're in a, a forest that doesn't have exotic invasive earthworms, it has a really springy sort of texture to it. It's almost kind of akin to 
to walking across a mattress. It's really, really springy. And when you walk across a forest that's got earthworms in it, I mean, I can tell immediately. As soon as I put my foot down on that soil, I can tell by how compacted it is, how dense it is, that there's earthworms present. So this is what our, our forest soils are, you know, I don't want to say supposed to look like, but what's the, what they've looked like historically. And now they've been converted to a much uh, denser soil, one that doesn't have nearly as much poorly decomposed organic matter in it. Absent now are all of these interstices for small bodied arthropods and small bar, uh, bodied organisms to live in. And it's much more dense and it tends to be a lot less nutrient rich as well. So this is what earthworms do to soil. This is a key part of the problem. They convert it to this spongy, porous, light, squishy, springy surface to one that's very, very dense and has very different biogeochemical processes. So these are some ways that exotic European earthworms are known to influence forest soils. Uh, some effects of European earthworms on forest vegetation. You know, another important lesson, anything you know, that impacts forest soils is gonna have an impact on that forest, right? But the soil is the foundation of that soil. So, so is the foundation of that forest. So if you alter the forest soil via pH or nutrient content or organic matter content or temperature or bulk density, you're gonna impact the vegetation that grows in that. And so on the left-hand side is a really nice, uh, you know, Michigan forest. We've got a few, you know, mature trees, lots of saplings coming up and a nice, you know, understory, a good covering of understory plants. This is the way our forests look in the absence of earthworms. And with them, we lose a lot of that herbaceous layer in particular. It's just not good conditions for germination of native plant seeds. And as a result of that, uh, notice lots and lots of you know, bare soil exposed here as well. So these are some of the consequences of these exotic European uh, earthworm introductions into our native, uh, native uh, soils. There's a real loss of plant diversity, especially uh, ground cover and understory plant diversity. I just wanted to point out uh, you know, something here before I kind of talk about different types of earthworms was, well, see, this is one of my intellectual heroes. His name is Robert MacArthur. He was a famous ecologist in the 50s and 60s. He, he died on his deathbed while he was working on a manuscript and he was a real field guy. So I admire him in a lot of ways. And he studied this group of, of, of wonderful birds called, called warblers. I'm sure you've heard of these. And what he was doing was testing a, a predominant theory at the time in ecology called the theory of competitive exclusion. So it basically states that if two species have really similar niches, one's gonna be a little bit better at it than the other, and it's gonna eventually outcompete the other species so that there'll only be one remaining. But here we are on a planet with 10 million species. And so when Robert MacArthur looked around and saw all this diversity, all this wonderful variety of life, and including in the warblers that he studied so much, he's studying 20, 30, 40 species of warblers, how can they all manage to coexist when they kind of had similar niches? I mean, they're all neotropical migrants for the most part. They eat insects. Uh, they, they live in the same species of trees, the same forest. How come one species of warbler wasn't just a little bit better at the others and didn't outcompete the others? How come we don't have one species of warbler and why do we have instead of about 30? Well, it turns out that these species are able to coexist because they partition resources. So let's see over here on the right-hand side, we've got five warblers. I think you can see all of these in Michigan. Yeah, all of these are found in Michigan. Uh, yellow rump warblers, are, they, they, they partition the tree so that they minimize overlap with other species. So the yellow rump warbler, this kind of uh, puce color down here, this is where they primarily feed, towards the bottom of the tree, whereas other species like the black Vernian warbler primarily feeds towards the top of the tree. So it's like they have an agreement. It's like you feed at the top of the tree, I'll feed at the bottom of the tree. That way we're able to coexist. One of us won't competitively exclude the other and we can have a diversity of warblers. Well, the same idea can be applied to lots of other groups of organisms as well, including earthworms. And that's why I mentioned that, that uh, um, Robert MacArthur example, I like him. And it works really well here for these different earthworm niches that they have. Uh, I think there's like three that we're gonna talk about, three or four. Um, just to give you an idea that not all earthworms are created equally. They have different uh, different jobs, different ecologies, different niches. The ones that I'm typically most interested in are called epigeic earthworms. And that's usually what these, uh, these amenthus or these Asian jumping worms belong to. They belong to this uh, epigeic class or these epiendogeic classes. So this basically just kind of tells you where the worms spend most of their time, 
uh, what they look like and what they feed on. And these epigeic species, they tend to exist on the very superficial layer of the leaf litter. These are the ones that you're finding when you're, you know, when you're working in your gardens and not digging up too much. Those species that are right there at the top, these are called epi. Epi means on top of or on the surface, so epigeic. These are litter dwellers. Uh, they have a pigmented skin color that way, you know, they're not super conspicuous to predators like birds and raccoons, etc. They tend not to make burrows, which is interesting. A lot of our other earthworms, they make these deep burrows, which introduces oxygen deep in the soil, soil profile and can influence nutrient cycling. Epigeic species don't do that so much, and they tend to be on the small side of uh, earthworms. Epiendogeic, and this is probably the best classification for these jumping worms we're going to talk about in just a slide or two. They tend to be found just beneath the litter. They, send, they still tend to be uh, pigmented. Uh, they rarely burrow very deeply, but often they have kind of shallow burrows, and they're more of a moderate size. And then we have these are what are called anisic species. They make really, really deep burrows. They often pull litter down into their burrows, which is pretty interesting that they're transferring these resources from the soil surface deep down into the soil profile. And again, they tend to dig these deep vertical unbranching burrows and they tend to be a little bit larger size. And then we have these endogeic species over here. They tend to feed directly on soil. They uh, tend to uh, not have as much skin pigmentation. They're spending most of their time in the soil so it wouldn't behoove them to have much pigmentation. Uh, and then they create this network of horizontal and branching burrows and they tend to be kind of medium sized. So, um, so again, these sort of ecological groups or guilds of earthworms have been identified based on the feeding and burrowing behaviors of these different species. Okay, so some other impacts that these exotic invasive earthworm species have, well, they can alter soil structure and nutrient profiles. They can alter the microbial community of subsoils. Uh, they particularly disrupt fungal networks. Bacteria aren't as impacted by earthworms as much as fungi are just by mechanically you know, bulldozing through that soil, they break up that hyphal network and can disrupt fungal communities that way. They tend to reduce the seed germination of native, spe native species, either because they consume the seeds directly or they just make the soil less conducive for seed germination. They tend to facilitate exotic invasive plant species. Garlic mustard tends to be associated with exotic invasive earthworms. So does buckthorn, so does autumn olive. Uh, so there seems to, seems to be some feedback between uh, exotic invasive plants and exotic invasive earthworms. It's this phenomenon called the, the invasive meltdown, the idea of you get a few species in there and it can kind of snowball. And after not too much time, you'll have a community primarily dominated by exotic invasive species. And when these riparian, when these worms are found in riparian zones, they can actually alter the flux of nutrients to stream and river ecosystems. So, you know, you're looking at a forest and it's got exotic invasive earth, earthworms in it. It's important to keep in mind that, you know, that's the source of water for streams and rivers. And if you're suddenly converting a lot of organic matter into a mineral form, that's much more soluble. It's gonna get delivered to streams and rivers much more, uh, much more readily. And this can influence water quality of streams and rivers. And you know, in the Great Lakes themselves, we have a lot of problems with nutrient loading. And to me, it's fascinating to think that you know how we manage the land, say around Grayling, Michigan, can have consequences for water quality in some places just as, as Lake Erie. And uh, earthworms can influence riparian zones through these sorts of mechanisms. Okay, well, you know, finally on to what you wanted me to talk about, which are this this group of uh, very different earthworms called uh, jumping worms. They belong to the genus Amenthus. Uh, there was some recent taxonomic re reclassification of this group. And so now it's called this Amenthus uh, metaphera complex. Um, in contrast to you know, kind of all those earthworm effects that I've been talking about based on European species, uh, Amenthus are from Asia. They're from an entirely different family of earthworms. And so they have a really different ecology uh, and they're seeming to have some different impacts uh, on our ecosystems. So they go by a bunch of different names, jumping worms, crazy worms, Alabama jumpers, um, snake worms. There's probably a bunch of others. I think I've seen them listed as Alabama blues. Um, so this is what we're talking about. Um, there are three epi 
There are three epigeic and epiendo species that are native to East Asia that we're finding regularly in the Great Lakes regions. These are Amenthus agrestis, Amenthus tokioensis, and Metaphyra hilgendorfi. Um, it's hard to tell them apart. It's something I struggle with quite a bit. You pretty much have to get in with a, you know, uh, you have to euthanize them, dissect them, and, and look at their gonads to, to say for certain. I've gotten pretty good at telling like Hilgendorfi from Agrestus. Agrestus seems to be the most common one that we're finding these days. But uh, Metaphyra Hilgendorfi, at the time it was called Amenthus Hilgendorfi, these were the ones that we found in the biological preserve in 2008. By the way, that was the first time uh, jumping worms were discovered in the state of Michigan was in, was in 2008. And again, it was the species Amenthus Hilgendorfi. And these guys, get, these guys get pretty big. I don't know how many of you are paying attention because I can't see you. But you know, they get pretty beefy. They're about like this and a bit thicker than a pencil. And so when they're dense, when there's a lot of them, when they're abundant, they're really conspicuous numbers in the landscape. They have really, really high growth rates. This is a unique, a unique attribute of this, of this Amenthus metaphyr complex. Um, Large-bodied European earthworms, uh, they're perennials. It takes them many years to complete their life cycle. Whereas Amenthus, they start off as teeny little cocoons in the early spring in like April, May. Those will emerge and become sexually mature adults by late summer, after which point the worms die and complete their life cycle. So they'll go from cocoon to, you know, big honking earthworm like this in a very compact time frame. They have a pretty flexible diet. This is something that's advantageous if you're an exotic invasive species. It helps if you can eat just about anything. And they have a pretty flexible diet of leaf litter, poorly decomposed organic matter, and some soil. And they can live in highly disturbed habitats. That's often where we find these guys. So that's a bit of an introduction to these Amenthus metaphyr complex. And here's what they look like. I'll tell you in a little bit how to identify these guys. Although, brace yourself, it is challenging. Okay, well, I mentioned their cocoons. Um, and their, their cocoons are important because this is probably how a lot of these earthworms are getting around. So as you can see here, um, these are not inches, these are centimeters. So this is from, from, you know, here from this eight to this nine, this is, oh, let's just say it's about a half an inch. So, you know, this is about a 20th of an inch across this little uh, cocoon here by Amenthus agrestis. They tend to be a little bit darker in color, so they blend in with a lot of soils. Because they're small and dark in color, they're hard to detect, although there are some ways that you can sample for these with a screen and some water. They, they often float, so you can use that as a means of, uh, of surveying them and see how abundant they are. And much more so than the, than the living organisms themselves, these cocoons are very resistant to drought and cold. If I go take a jumping worm and put it in my refrigerator for a few hours, it'll, it'll be dead. If I take one of these cocoons and freeze it, uh, it'll, it's good for months. So these guys are really, really tough to, to kill. And this is probably how a lot of jumping worms are getting around the landscape by different mechanisms that transport their cocoons. Well, I mentioned that they grow really, really quickly. So here's a, here's a picture of these worms from our preserve. This is a Minthus hilgendorfi. Gosh, I wish I would have had something for scale in here. I'm surprised I didn't. But from the top of this guy to the bottom down here, this is on the order of about, oh, I don't know, six or seven inches, something like that. And this is what they look like early in spring. They're just, they're teeny little guys. They barely look like jumping worms. And in just a couple of months, they can reach sexual, sexual maturity. So they grow really, really fast in a single season. We went and sampled earthworms on the preserve at Oakland University every other day or so for growing season. And these are the data that we generated. And with the sort of data, which is the biomass of the earthworm on these different sampling dates, then we can go ahead and calculate things like growth rates and we can compare them to different species. And species that have, excuse me, species that have high growth rates are very often successful invaders. This is an attribute of a lot of indifferent invasive species. They simply grow quickly. And if they can grow quickly and reach sexual maturity, maturity quickly, it does help them as invaders. Well, this is something you guys have probably seen in your gardens and in the areas where you've worked are these, you know, these pretty dramatically altered soils. Right after this slide, I have a video of my, um, of Holly kind of manipulating some soil where she lives in Royal Oak, Michigan. But this is the telltale sign of these jumping worms are these really conspicuously granulated soils. So each of these little grains here, these little particles or clasts is, oh, I don't know, it's about the size of a BB, you know, maybe three millimeters across, something like that, a tenth of an inch. Um, they can really alter soil structure. And, you know, oftentimes I'll go to a new place and you just know immediately that it's got these jumping worms because you can see 
uh, this physically altered soil. And this tends to be more conspicuous in the later summer. By that time, the earthworms are much more larger bodied. You know, July, August, September, these are the months when they're large bodied. They seem to be really active in the heat of uh, late summer. And uh, it's when you can see these, uh, these really granulated soils. So let's see if I can get this video to work for you. No promises. I have not actually. Oh, let me see. Patience, please. Let's try here. Well, if it doesn't work out, don't feel too disappointed. It was a video of someone, <laughs> someone digging through some soil. Actually, I watched this before I spoke with you all today, and I was thinking, gosh, it'd be nice to go dig through some through some soil like that right now and pull some weeds or something like that. Look, there's some weeds we can pull right there. What is that? The creeping Charlie or whatever. So, anyways, all it was is just a video of more of those uh, those earthworm casts, that physically modified soil. So how do these amenthas compare to, to say European species that are a little bit better studied? Well, they have similar impacts, but they tend to happen a lot faster, right? Like almost immediately after introduction. Uh, and I think their impacts are a bit more uh, severe. So this organic matter, this, this leaf litter layer, this detritus, all of that gets consumed very, very quickly. Uh, these are nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, bound up in that organic matter. So it's in an organic form. It's bound up in things like, you know, you know, proteins and extracellular enzymes. But what happens is when earthworms come along and consume that organic matter, they mineralize it and they release it in a mineral form that's a lot more readily transported from the landscape because it's a lot more water soluble, right? Uh, so earthworms, for example, they can really reduce the, the humic content of your soils. They can really reduce um, the overall nitrogen content. And, and this is, again, is because they're converting this organic matter into a mineral form that's a lot more soluble so that when it rains, uh, it gets transported from the system. So uh, as a result uh, of this, um, you know, the consumption of these nutrients and the release of these nutrients, it can really alter the, the productivity of these soils. Um, it seems as though these jumping worms, in some instances, they're out competing European species because they mature really, really quickly. They, they reproduce quickly and we're finding them at much greater densities. Um, this is something that's been documented in the literature elsewhere. I haven't seen this too much in Michigan. If I go over, you know, roll over some logs where I live in Southeast Michigan, there's European species there. There's Asian species there as well. So I think they're, they're managing to coexist, but it's going to take a little bit of time for that to play out to see you know, how these really different species are going to interact with each other. And, you know, it, it's a bit of a contest to see who's going to be able to persist. Okay, well, a lot of, uh, a lot of you are probably curious about how to identify jumping worms. You know, late in the summer, I'm not going to say my phone's ringing off the hook, but, you know, I'll maybe get a dozen calls from different people and they're saying, you know, how do I identify these? And it, it's pretty tough. I usually just say, why don't you just go ahead and ship me, <laughs> ship some to me and I'll identify, identify them for you. But but here's what they look like. Um, this to me looks like Amenthus agrestis in the upper right-hand side. And down here we have one of our most common uh, European earthworms called Lumbricus rubellus. If you go to the store and buy some earthworms for fishing, there's a good chance they're gonna be Lumbricus rubellus. This is a very common European species and one of the most damaging. Um, so here's how I tell jumping worms from European species. So first of all, the color is a little bit different to me. It's got kind of this, uh, this creamy, uh, creamy gray, almost tan color throughout. And the clitellum is really, really lightly colored. So this is the, the sexual reproduction part of the, of the earthworm, it's clitellum. It can release both sperm and eggs from this. They're simultaneously hermaphroditic. And when they're sexually mature, they'll have this real distinct band and it is, it is tan in color. And here's, here's a good trick. This is one of the better ways to distinguish European from uh, Asian species. So if you find the clitellum, here it is on the, um, uh, this uh, European species, see how it kind of bulges right here. It's kind of the fattest part of this part of the earthworm. It really bulges. Whereas for the Asian species, the jumping worms, it actually contracts a little bit here. It's kind of hourglass shape. It's not the best photo for it, but you're gonna have to take my word for it. It's a little bit of an hourglass shape to the clitellum of the Asian species. That's how I tell them apart as well. A few other ways you can do it. If you're holding an amethyst jumping worm, they're harmless. You can pick them up. 
there's a good chance it's going to be thrashing violently in your hand, really trying to jump out of your hand. In contrast to the European species, they're just going to kind of scoot their way out of your hand. These guys actually jump. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? So the clitellum is smooth, white, and euler, that means it has this kind of hourglass shape to it. And it tends to be a little bit closer to the head. Uh, the head is just the, the end of the earthworm. How do you tell which end is the head? It's the end that has the clitellum on it. And the clitellum is positioned a little bit closer to the head of the earthworm in Amenthus than it is in these European species. And again, for me, this, you know, this thrashing behavior is really conspicuous. Uh, and their means of locomotion. They have this kind of serpentine locomotion where they, you know, they slither like a snake. Um, this isn't something that, uh, that European earthworms do. And then lastly, they have this ability for their tails to break off. This is called caudal autonomy. You know, you've seen this in lizards and geckos and stuff. If you pick up an amethyst earthworm by the tail, uh, there's a good chance it's gonna break off and it'll squirm in your hand for a second. And this is a very useful adaptation for eluding predators. Uh, and so they have that trait as well. So that's a way that you can help distinguish these species. I'm gonna take a break for a second and try to answer a question of, uh, of Elizabeth Siegel's. Um, sorry, I thought it was, wasn't it Betty? Betty, if I called you by the incorrect name, I apologize. So her question is, if both European and Asian species are invasive, maybe it doesn't matter if we ID them correctly. Should we just destroy them both? And I think, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty sensible, uh, a sensible answer. Um, they, they're both exotic. They both have deleterious impacts. I don't want either of these in, you know, the wetland that I'm trying to preserve. But I think the key difference is, uh, you know, the European species are really well established. They've been here for probably over 100 years, and they're not going anywhere. Um, my feeling is, is that when we add a new species onto a community, it's going to have some new effects. And so even if there's a, an established community of European earthworms, um, adding a mythos to that is not going to help. And there's lots of Michigan, probably maybe, maybe even the majority of Michigan, that hasn't had Asian earthworms introduced to them yet. So there's lots of areas worth preserving. So, so yes, you are right. I think both groups of earthworms are very bad, but I think there's still time for us to do something about jumping worms. And I think they're still actively spreading in their range, whereas earthworms from Europe, uh, maybe not so much. Thanks for the question. Let's see if I can keep going here. Well, much earlier in the growing season, you know, we're talking about like April and May, uh, the earthworms are a lot, lot smaller. So if it's May and you find a really big earthworm, it's not going to be a Memphis. It's going to be one of these other European species. So this is what they look like when they're babies, teeny tiny little guys. They still have this really rough, uh, violent sort of thrashing behavior. Oops. Oh boy. I'm not going to panic here. It's Carol, am I, am I back on board there? You're back. Okay. Oh, hey, I got the video to work. You know, you're going to see the thrashing behavior in a second. See that? That's distinctive. If you find a teeny little worm like that, I can play it again, and it thrashes about in your hand, that is a jumping. That's why they call them jumping. So thank you, Holly, for that useful video. That is very good. And this is an example of that caught a location. So they've got just a little pinch point right here and they have the ability, I don't know if they can control the release of this or if it's just something that happens to them or what, but they have this ability to have their tail break off. And this is a great defense against predators. So it's tough to ID them in the spring unless they do that nice thrashing behavior for you. Um, that's a really good clue. Otherwise they look like European species. If you wanted to look at them under the scope, I could get, just give you some other tips, but I think that's probably adequate for most of your needs. Well, how do we prevent their spread? You know, this is something that I've been telling to a lot of people who, are, who do like plant trading and plant swaps like you guys do is, you know, bare rootstock is really the preferable way to go in terms of preventing the spread of exotic species in general, including exotic invasive earthworms. Um, I've been working with Ben Vanderweed in Southeast Michigan here. He works for Oakland Township as their natural areas steward coordinator. And they do a lot of restoration. Those guys put tens of thousands of plants tens of thousands of plugs in the ground every year. Um, but they're doing that with bare root stock now. They've modified their behavior since they've learned about the problems associated with these exotic invasive earthworms. So, you know, when you guys do your plant swaps, it takes a little bit of extra effort, but 
you know, take time to rinse the soil off your plants before you share them because plants in pots or, you know, bound roots or again, anything that moves soil around is going to move those little cocoons around. It's going to move those little earthworms around. And given where I'm seeing earthworms in the landscape, often like in, in new suburbs area where there's lots of new landscaping, that's where I'm seeing a lot of these earthworms. I'm pretty convinced that the horticultural industry is responsible for most of the amenthus introductions in the state. So, so take time to rinse the soil off of your plants and you will do a good job of preventing the spread of exotic invasive earthworms. Well, here's some, here's some notes that Holly has jotted down for him. I'm gonna go through these for you. I think that most of this is pretty good common sense stuff, but I think it bears repeating. So, you know, it's always good to know where your soil and your plants came from. Um, if, you, if you get a plant as a gift from somebody and you look at the soil and it's, and it's granulated like that photo I showed you of, the soil's really granulated, there's a good chance there's some earthworms in there and some jumping worms in there. So I would really recommend you know, disposing of that soil throw it in the garbage. I don't think it matters too much if our landfills get exotic invasive earthworms or, or burn it. Uh, that'll go a long ways to getting rid of those earthworms that are contaminating it. And then just go ahead and repot, repot with, with clean potting soil. I don't see uh, potting soil from my big box store, or my hardware store contaminated with earthworms too much. I think that's generally pretty safe. Um, you can submerge the roots in water before transplanting. That's a great way to get rid of the loose soil or just hose it off here in like in the photograph in the lower right-hand side. Uh, keep your gardening tools, tools clean, especially if you're you know, jumping around the landscape a bit, going to a friend's house to help with gardening, et cetera. Store plants for sale on soil-free surfaces like tarps, concretes, trays, et cetera. Um, I would sell and purchase compost treated, uh, compost that's been heated to an appropriate temperature. Uh, if you heat compost, this is a good way to dispose of, of unwanted critters in it. Uh, and if you find uh, jumping worms, um, you know, your, your house or your, your property is unfortunately invaded with them. So I'd be really hesitant to, to share mulch or wood chips or, or firewood or anything from that property because it's contaminated with these worms which spread from place to place so readily. Some other best practices, especially if you're active and outdoorsy type of person. So take time to remove dirt from vehicles, boots, gear, pets, etc. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways you can treat your boots or, or your waders, etc. Uh, but, you know, getting the soil off is going to go a long ways towards doing that. And then I think transporting firewood is, as well. I've, I've cracked open firewood. I, I heat my house with firewood. I go through about 15, 17 face cords of woody here. There's been a lot of instances where I'll split open a pretty old piece of wood uh, and find earthworms inside it. So I think earthworms are another way, uh, uh, firewood is another way that earthworms are getting around the landscape. In case any of you are interested in vermicomposting, this is something that I do at my house. I wanna advocate for the use of the species of earthworms called Isenia fetida or red wigglers. Um, these are really, really good earthworms. These guys are not invasive. Uh, I've never found these in Michigan soils. I've never found them more than a few feet away from compost bins. Um, I compost with these outside my home. They, they primarily eat vegetable waste, um, kitchen scraps, et cetera. There's really not much for them in our native forests. And so these are great, super safe earthworms that you can use for composting or for fishing. We use them for fishing, especially in the winter. They tend to be a little bit on the small side, so they're not super desirable for like big bass fishermen. But for people who can hand fish, perch, little trout, these guys are great fishing bait. And this is what they look like. This, this is the telltale sign of Isenia fetida or these red wigglers. Uh, they have these distinct yellow bands. Uh, now, here's the thing. You can get online and you can type in composting earthworms and there's, you're going to encounter dozens of websites across the, across the country that sell ex, uh, composting earthworms. But the problem is a lot of times they're not identified correctly. And in a lot of instances too, there's exotic earthworms that are contaminating these redworm batches that you're buying and you can introduce them to the landscape as well. But I'm happy to say that Happy D Worm Ranch, here's the, here's the website down here, here's the URL, www.happydranch.com. I bought a bunch of earthworms from them in the past and they always sell what they say they're selling. They always sell Isenia fetida. Lots of other distributors around the country, they say they're selling them, but they're hard to identify. They don't know how to identify them and they're just selling you the worms that they happen to have. And there's a good chance they're not Isenia fetida. So these guys are great for vermicomposting. 
and they're also really good for fishing bait as well. Uh, so similarly, you know, fishermen are probably responsible for, for moving earthworms around the landscape. Again, I challenge you to find a small mom pa gas station convenience store in the summertime in Michigan that doesn't sell, you know, usually waltz crawlers, right? They sell these fishing bait. They're little containers of exotic invasive species. And what happens, you know, you go, you, uh, you go fishing at the end of the day and, you know, you're done and you've got your leftover bait and maybe your husband doesn't want these in your refrigerator because he thinks they're gross. And so what do you do? You just, you know, you top them, toss them into the riparian zone. You don't want to kill them. Uh, so you just toss them into the riparian zone, but you know what? They're going to thrive there. They're going to take over there. Uh, there's earthworms in that soil. There's cocoons in that soil. So this is how these earthworms are getting around the landscape. And in other states uh, that have more progressive policies towards uh, the prevention of exotic invasive species. They have a whole program around exotic invasive earthworms and anglers called Contain Those Crawlers. So it's a public uh, campaign sponsored by the state that teaches anglers how to, de how to get rid of their, uh, their bait safely. It's a good program. And I think, you know, they've really been leading the front. Minnesota DNR has really been leading the charge on uh, European earthworms in general. And it's my hope that um, that Michigan can really become a leader uh, in jumping worm ecology and, and, and help teach others about the problems of this, uh, of this invasive species. Okay, so where are they in Michigan now? Um, we really don't know. No one's done a proper survey to my knowledge. There are a few reports here and there, usually around urban centers, right? There's some over by Kalamazoo. Imagine this is you guys in Lansing. Here's me in Southeast Michigan. I mean, there are, <laughs> there's only about a, what, a dozen spots here at most in Michigan. Uh, I know of hundreds of locations. So this is clearly an underreporting. Um, they tend to be pretty patchy. They do well in riparian zones. They tend not to like sandy soils too much. But my hope is that uh, you know we, we get some grant money and we go out and do a proper survey of the state and find out where they're located and find the sort of habitats where they thrive and, and importantly identify the areas where they have not been introduced yet and, and quadrant these off and really protect these areas. So I think we need better surveys to understand the distribution of jumping worms across the state and the habitats that are amenable to their invasion. Nationally, they're in most states now. I don't imagine the really arid states are gonna have a problem as much of these. I think they need fairly most soil, but as you can see, they're, they're spreading their range across the country. Okay, well, if you do find exotic invasive earthworms, there's some things you can do. You can contact your local SISMA coordinator. You can get on the MISIN network and report the sighting there. Um, you can drop a pin into iNaturalist or some of these other great online resources that are being increasingly used to track well, all species, really birds and, and, and also those that are problematic like exotic invasive earthworms. Um, and there's also a thing called Great Lakes Worm Watch and you can drop a pin there and note the location. And let me see. Yeah, that's all I have. Um, well, thanks for your time. Thanks for being such a good audience. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. You didn't have a chance about, <laughs> about being a good audience. You were muted the whole time, but, but thanks for the question. I'm going to try uh, to see if I can um, get people to uh, be able to talk, but. Yeah, you have, to, you have to unmute them. Yes. Uh, Ed Bonin had a question here. It says, what do you do with the rinsed soil? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I try to minimize the amount of kind of slurry that I generate. And usually I'm doing the rinsing at a place that's already contaminated with earthworms, which is my backyard. So I usually just water my grass with it to tell you the truth that, but you know, if you're in a place that doesn't have earthworms and you know, you're cleaning some plants that maybe came from, came from elsewhere, I'm, I'm glad to see that you're thinking about that. I have never tried this, but I strongly suspect if you had a, say a five gallon bucket that was mostly full of some slurry that you generated from rinsing the roots of plants, and you put, I don't know, half a cup of bleach in there, that'd probably take them, that'd probably take care of them. And then just let that sit for a couple of days. That bleach will off gas and you could just dump that on your grass and it'll probably be fine. So I hope that helps. 